You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Happy Monday night. How is everybody doing? Can I get a mic check, mic check? It has been, it's insane since I started this show. This is the longest time I've gone without specifically talking about the title Potomac River ever. But my God, are we going to have some Potomac River content with the amount of tournaments? Uh, I get it's an organizational thing where you have all these tournaments stacked, but BFL Super Tournament, then the Toyota Series, and then God knows what else, just every other weekend. And you saw this in the spring too, where you had um, the Bass Nation Tournament, then you had the, uh, the to- not the Toyota Series, the Tackle Warehouse Invitational. You had like four or five weekends just stacked. And it's interesting to see that this river will go a while without a lot happening and all of a sudden it just gets murdered for like a month straight and and to talk about it i have one of the one of my good friends he's been on the show a couple of times and and how we had to bring him back to talk about this crazy couple of weeks and how he's been doing uh captain chris johnson sir thank you so much for coming on the show thank you thank you thomas man i really appreciate the show man and what you're doing for the dmv yeah, the, the Potomac man is, is just definitely getting beat on, man, pretty bad, man. But probably not as bad as uh as the Giants, you know, going against the Cowboys, man. Look like they're getting beat down just as bad as the river is. But but no, man, um, it, it's 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 been a struggle out there, man. We got a lot of tournaments going on. Um, you know, we got this summer fall transition thing going on where they're kind of getting that little funk, you know. So, um. I don't know about everybody else in the angler community. I think we're praying for all the grass to really, really, really start dying and these uh, nighttime temperatures, man, where you got to, you know, light a fire outside and get cozy with your girlfriend or your wife. We were looking, we're looking forward to that type of stuff, man. That's what's going to make these fish eat better. So um, definitely, definitely looking forward um, for this fall uh, transitional bite, man. I mean, I, I'm seeing flurries of it, man. And, uh, you know, I've seen some of it, you know, trying to practice for the Toyota series. And I think uh, some of the guys fishing that super turn, I believe it was uh, a week before, I, th- I think they probably seen it as well. But, um, you know, we were talking previously, man, we were talking about the weights and how low they were. And yeah, I, I kind of suspected it, but, you know, it's, it's, you know, it, it kind of is what it is with the, with the fall bite, you know. I don't know if you got it kind of pulled in front of you, though. But, I do. Uh, yeah, because some of those weights, man, that's going from the winter to the, you know, the check line was a lot lower, you know, than usual. I mean, you can kind of – that's a great graphic right there. there and we're going to start – let's actually start with the BFL Super Tournament. BFL Super Tournament, you get yeah, Zachary, uh, I think Stupa. I'm sorry if I pol- apologize if I say your name wrong. I know I'm going to have you on the show here uh, or later this week. Uh, Miles Pog, this is like his second time fishing the Potomac, and he's finished there twice. Mm-hmm. But anyway, let's get to the weights here. So, you know, first day was 12 pounds. Second day, 16, great bag. You know, 13, 14, got you second. But you're talking – you know, 29 to 28 pounds overall, but it was 14 yeah. and a half to 14 total to win. That's pretty crazy. And then, and then it drops off. If you guys go down to 10 pounds here and hopefully everyone can see this. Okay. On the screen, I'll highlight it for you here uh, to get a top 10 in the BFL super tournament, 11 pounds a day. That's like Kerr reservoir type of numbers. <laughs> and that's yeah. insane for the Potomac. And and you look at that number and you're thinking like, man, eleven pounds. Oh man, I can go out there and get eleven pounds. But I tell you, you know, eleven pounds with that many boats out there, plus this this summertime funk, it's a lot uh, harder um, than people realize. Um, you know, because in the back of a lot of guys' head, um, unless you uh, come during that late summer or uh, early fall kind of funk. You think back in April or May or June, even June, you know what I mean? Let's get off the the, the, the real post, uh, peak of the spawn. When we start looking at like postpone going into June, even early July, 11 pounds is not, not, I mean, it's not much, but 11 pounds now, that's why I say this will separate the boys from the men. When you go into this late summer, early fall transition, these fish are always moving around. They're sitting in a lot of these grass beds 
and they're not actively feeding. Um, some of these fish are transitioning from the grass to wood or grass to uh, rock. And I think the one, the angler that can really find these fish first, they are transitioning from the grass to the rock or the grass to the wood. Those, I believe, are the guys that are successful. And I can't say uh, for sure, but looking at, at these top five, top ten guys, how many of those guys were actually fishing grass? Some of them may have been fishing up north and fishing hardcover, um, you know, which a lot of those fish are going to eventually uh, start going towards. I mean, you go up north, there's not a whole lot of grass anyway, so they're already kind of there. Um, and some of them are feeding deep, some of them might be feeding shallow. So I think it takes out that third element when you're uh, fishing hard cover up north. Once you go south, you're talking pretty much from you know three creeks on down to a choir, even Potomac Creek. It's a totally different animal, you know. Now you got aquaquam, you got some hard cover in there, you got some hard cover in a choir. There's some hard cover in Matter Woman. Um, you know, there's there's some even in Potomac Creek, but I think one of the biggest things that I'm gonna say the South guy, as I consider myself a South guy, I love fishing grass. Biggest thing, guys, that y'all can do, let me take it from me, look for the greenest grass you find. If you want to fish grass, find the greenest grass that you can find. It's still pumping oxygen. You know, uh, the other thing is look for bait. You know, Thomas. It's been a big controversy. You know, we're talking about Menhaden and Bunker. Mm -hmm. I, I think what a lot of guys are seeing in one of the, one of the local creeks, it's not shad. It's actually Menhaden. It's actually Bunker. Really? Um, because that saltwater wedge has pushed so far north. I mean, I was looking at like seven, eight-inch crabs in Quantico. You know, so a lot of those Bunker and smaller Menhaden, I mean, they're three, four, three, four inches long. Wow. They schooled it up, and what I seen in one of the local creeks, they were busting on them. I mean, you're talking 50 to 75 of them just exploding in the air. And I ended up getting one, I think it was like three, three and a quarter, something like that. But what happens is they move around so much in the grass, and they and it's hard for them to key in your little white frog. You know, usually that's what you want to use. You want to use a white something that mimics what they're after. The problem is. There's so much bait. How can you trick them into eating your real bait? And I think that's the problem I've had. And they were just quickly just munching on stuff. So you, it's like just don't give them a lot of time to look at that frog. And I was working it fast. And then there's other times, you know, you have it sit there and they blow up on, you know. So it, it was real, real funny, the bike that I, I had in one of the local creeks. I mean, I, you know, I'd you be straight up. I was in Chickamauga, and they're blowing up on bait like everywhere. I mean, everywhere in there, they're blowing up bait. And I watched, you know, one of the anglers in there, he had just this nice little cut. And they were, not you know, like, blowing up around him. And I don't know what he was doing. He was using some type of finesse technique. I don't know if it was a power shot, a Nico rig. You know, it was a lighter, lighter color bait, and you know, man, he was just—I mean, he was just dead sticking it. I mean, just straight up dead sticking it. So, it, you got a lot of different uh, techniques that are working out here, and it's you know whatever does good for you. For me, I—I I was confident in that frog, and I threw it, and I threw it. I mean, you live by the frog, you die by the frog, and. You know, for me, I had the bites, just didn't capitalize. And day two, I was like, okay, I got to do something a little different. But one thing that was key uh, to get bites from me, especially on that frog, man, low water, low water, low water. And day one was a lot better. Day two was a little later. Plus, we had the storm coming. So it pushed a lot of water in, and it pushed it in quickly. Um uh, once my little bait died in Chickamauga, I ran into a Quantico, and uh, the bait there, man, was was slow. I mean, I moved all around. I think my co angler caught a good one, close to three. You know, I had a short, 
And yeah, we just moved toward the back. I said, Michael Iconelli, man, I tell you, that dude's an animal. <laughs> so he just shot all the way back. And I was like, well, Ike's up here. So, you know, I see him pulling another area closer to the mouth of the chick. And, you know, I pulled away from him because I didn't want to get involved with Mr. Iconelli. <laughs> so I got just, yeah, I got I got a good little way because I didn't want, <laughs> you know. So, but no, he was he was a respectful guy, man. I mean, you know, he, I didn't see him getting to it with anybody or nothing like that. So, I mean, he, I mean, I'm I'm sure he's a great great guy, man, on, on the water as well as off the water. But, but you know, I keyed in my area, man. I, I focused in what my strong point was was throwing that frog. I had a lot of wild celery grass around me, and you know, I had some sporadic uh, milfoil around me, and. I noticed one thing. I've said this. I wrote a uh, a piece one time. It was like, what do you look for in a frog bite? But I heard something that I hadn't heard in a long time. And I don't know about y'all guys. I got. I know I sound a little corny right now, but you know, when you get some Rice Krispies and you pour your little milk into it, all you a sudden you hear. Tch, tch, tch. When you start hearing Rice Krispies out there, yeah, it's time to break out that frog, man. Uh-huh. And, it was a different bike from what I had in, in Chicken Monks and where I think they were after like Shed or Bunker. In, uh, in Quantico, it seemed like they were, it was a, a brim bite or a bluegill bite. And hmm. I, I, what I'm thinking is they're more stationary. They're more sitting in the grass. They're not running around all over the place like maniacs like they were in chicken monks. So those fish, I, I really believe in my heart, if I stayed, if I started in uh, uh, Quantico, I probably would have had a, had a better day. But well, Let's talk about your overall decision. So going into the Toyota series, it's going to be a big event. Did you think just chicken die? Like what was your, what was your mind at going into day one of how you're going to strategize? It's funny you say, Saying it like that too, because man, when I seen it, I mean, I literally had, I mean, even rewinding it, I, I didn't even know I was going to fish this event until like, I don't know, I think it was like Monday or Tuesday or something. Whoa. And yeah, so I did, I had no way of really preparing hardcore. I just said, man, I'm just going to go out, you know, I think it was like Tuesday or Wednesday. And I was like, man, I'm just going to go out. And it was weird. So I, I mean, I launched out Fairview Beach, ran up north. I mean, so I was like, man, I'm just going to fish hard until, I mean, I had to go back to work at like 2.30. I was like, man, I'm just going to go here and pound the river. And, um, you know, so I pulled up a Quantico Creek. I was like, man, what happened? I didn't hit my grass for front wood and work and boom, boom, boom. I was like, what is going on? I was like, every time there's a big event, it's like, okay, here come the gremlins. And so I'm working on the boat. I end up getting everything going. Um, I seen... Uh, I was in Quantico. I was going to practice in there. I seen guys coming in, coming in. I was like, man, I don't know if I'm going to start here because there's a lot of a lot of guys coming in here. So I opt out, end up going to the chick, and I pull up, and I had a little grass flat, you know, on the shoreline, and uh, had two good blow ups. So I was like, oh, okay, okay. I was kind of happy I didn't hook them, so I like, but it let me know, hey, I got a frog right here. The grass was pretty decent here. I'll leave it alone. So let me check this out. There. So there's a little mat in the middle, and I checked it out, and I seen a lot of activity going on in there. And I said, man, this this might be worth a little something. And, man, I mean, it looked like somebody was throwing M80s out there, man. It was like, boom, wow. man. It's like it bait, like, exploding all over the place and stuff. I was like, oh, man, my, thought, my heart got to pound. And around that time, I'm looking at my watch. It's like, oh, man, I got to – it's like 220. I got to get back to Fairview, 245, and – I just bought butt back to Fairview and it's like, man. So, but I ended up starting my day uh, on on the chick because I was like, man, I really didn't have a whole lot more. But I knew that I knew that section of the river well. So I was like, I'm just going to fish my strength best way I can and make uh, sound decisions based on like tide and flow, um, tide flow and everything. That's and a good thing to get into. What tide were you guys dealing with tournament day? Yeah, so I, I believe the low tide was like seven in the morning on the first day. So um, okay. I think I was like boot 88 or something like that. So, I mean, I wasn't tripping too much on, on the boat numbers and stuff. 
I mean, I thought it was a good draw anyway. It could kind of put me in the middle of the field both days instead of, like, being early one day and then get the disappointment. I can't get on the spot. But, um, you know, I was able to both days pretty much get the spot I had in, in uh, Chickamauga. And, um, you know, that tie was, like I said, 7 o'clock, man, low tide. I love a low tide bite on my frog. And it's funny. It's like you're fishing and you're fishing and you're seeing this grass flat this you know, just getting swallowed up by water. And, you know, I stayed there and stayed there. I, I, I tell you, I really think I stayed there a little long, longer than I wanted to. I wanted, my key was I wanted to stay there about an hour, no more than two hours. I want to stay about an hour, hour and a half. And I got hung up on it, man, because they're still blowing up on bait, but it got a lot harder to get, get a bite. I talked to my co angler, said, you know, I was like, man, what you think, you know? And I told him, hey, you know, I mean, hey, I mean, I want, I want you to have a great day too, you know. Um, so I said, hey, let's let's run up north. So you know, I ran up north the Greenway because I knew um, there's some nice looking grass up there. I mean, I kind of, I kind of gambled, you know, because I hadn't practiced up there. I hadn't been up in a little while, but I knew that grass was deep and I knew it was uh, pretty green. So I was like, you know, maybe maybe they'll school up pretty good up there. I don't know if I had a bad tide or whatever. I stayed up there a little while, seen Brian Smith up there, man, the great angler, man, great guy. Um, yeah, I see him pulling off. I was like, oh man, I don't know if it's good now. You know, I see Brian pulling off. So but I fished it. I gave it some time. I fished from five all the way up to about seven feet of water. Got I pushed up about three, four feet of water, um, throwing a, a chatterbait, threw swim jigs some. I couldn't even get a sniff. My co angler hmm. nothing. So I say, man, maybe we should head on back. But what was your ideas going into day two then? Repeat. So I, you know, my idea on day two was like, you know, I knew I had a good frog bite first thing in the morning. So I said, I tell you what, I'm gonna do a little different, and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna fish there about an hour, hour and a half, then make that move. And and that's what I did. I, you know, we were getting bit on the frog. I think I ended up getting one. Uh, about three, three and a quarter. So I said, yeah, it's starting to slow up. I threw a swim jig, chatted a bit a little, little while because, you know, that grass gets kind of swallowed up. So I said, I'm going to back up off of it and maybe there's some fish still hanging around in that grass I can pull off on a swim jig or chatter bait. No avail. So I seen guys running out. I was like, yes, yeah, I think that's the cue. That's the funny thing about the Potomac. Every, every, everybody fish is kind of in sync. And you can kind of tell. It's like, hey, mm -hmm. if I'm not getting bit, and you've seen guys moving, it's like, yeah, everybody else kind of sees the same thing on little, little areas. So I was like, that that's cueing me. Hey, Chris, it's time to go. So I head over to check. Um, I go under the bridge, and, you know, I see a few boats here, see a guy there. Um, I don't remember who it was. It was somebody that had a camera boat on them. And so I went on past them and waved to them. And uh, so I fished a little area. It's like, man, I couldn't get bit on a chatterbait. It had a couple little bumps. I don't know. They could have been bluegill, yellow person. Then I went toward the back, and I see Michael Iaconella just, yeah. <laughs> it's just flying toward the back. I don't know. He must have been doing about 70 going back there. But Good Lord. Um, it, was, <laughs> it was funny. But, uh, you know, so how, I, I, I. If I, if I may, um, how yeah. was everyone spread out in the field? Because generally speaking, like, Potomac is is vaunted for its traffic jams on the grass beds. Yeah, honestly, man, it was it was pretty spread out. I mean, surprisingly, even in Chickamauga, I mean, I thought, I mean, the guy that was next to me, I don't know, 50, 60, maybe 70 yards, but we didn't have nobody else around. It was just us two. It was weird. It was just us two both days sitting next to each other. So hmm. it was weird. I kind of pulled up near his spot. And I couldn't make nothing of it. And I see the guy's boat. And I ain't going to lie to you. I'm going to tell you the truth, man. I, I I try to be as ethical as I can. I seen him come in the creek. And I knew he was on good fish. And I knew he had a chance to get a check. I intentionally pulled off his spot. I intentionally pulled off his spot because I knew the guy had a chance. I didn't know how to fish it. I knew I had my way of fishing that area. And he came on in and I didn't have a problem. I don't even know the guy's name. I didn't even I didn't even look, didn't even know. 
Um, but I ever I knew that he was on some fish, and I didn't want to uh, hijack his spot. So you know, I let the guy come on in. I didn't tell him to come on in or nothing like that. I seen him, and I kind of came off the area a little bit, and. You know, I mean, that's just that's just me. That's how I do. Maybe I'm too good. I don't know. But um, I just thought that was the ethical thing to do, man, because I've had situations and when that happened and, you know, it's not fun. It's so hard. I mean, if you look and, and I think I, I mentioned this offhandedly about like a Kerr Reservoir, you get a big lake and you get two people on a cove. It feels crowded. The Potomac, yeah. it's just it's almost like you have to have different ethics for different bodies of water. And it's hard because I know when when you and I have, have fished like spring tournaments in you know Belmont Bay, Madam, I'm like, dude, it's packed, and it's just like usually there's no fights generally speaking compared to if you had the same circumstance on name a lake and there would be a fist fight. Yeah, yeah, you know, and I, I think I think one of the biggest things is um, you know locals. You know, fishing, you know, like with Bob Patrick, like Potomac teams or, you know, the Wednesday nighters, stuff like that. I, I think there's just an agreement. We just know, you know what I mean? I mean, we kind of go around the wheel, so to speak, yeah. you know, and, you know, there's just, I've I've, I've never uh, seen anybody just get into like altercations out there on the water, man. Not, you know, I mean, it might be like, uh, not a disagreement, but, Maybe a misunderstanding or something like that. Yeah, you know, it's like, hey, well, which way are you going? Hey, I'm going this way. And all right, I'm going there. And that's it. You know what I mean? Because, you know, I don't know what Thomas is doing. Thomas might not know what Chris is doing. But I think I think the biggest thing on, on the water, man, is, is communication. I think that's the biggest thing. Because I don't think nobody, like, goes out there but like, oh, I don't want him to fish this. I don't want him to fish that. You know, it's just communication. Because 10 minutes, I mean, they'll be – right on my spot anyway so that's kind of like kind of like an ethical thing i guess man it's just you know you have your spot but we kind of rotate through just through the area like i said belmont is one of those areas i mean potomac is a, is a community big community hole i mean it is one big community hole yeah you know I mean, even there a, a choir you know, at the beach it's i mean i remember aba tournament like way back you know when there were uh uh weekend series and man, you pull you pull up in a choir, man, at the beach, and there'd be like 30, 40 boats. And you know, I mean, there might be like little spots, like you know, off some of these docks, or you know, maybe there's a, a, a shell bed that was like really, really small. But the area, the area, yeah. and I mean, there ain't nobody getting into it like that, man. Hey, man, no. and a lot of times everybody was catching fish. You're right. I mean, it's just the areas are known, and that's no big deal. Let's say like it's Matter Woman or, or it, it, it's a quiet. It's it's the spot within the spot that you found something a little sneaky. That's right. Uh, and I've been shocked at how much Potomac Creek has come back over the years. I remember when that thing died for a while, and that thing has came back. And what's crazy is this actually kind of goes into a question I just saw on our chat by mm -hmm. Brandon. How does the saltwater? I think he said intrusion. Yeah, intrusion affect bass. Yeah, I, I, that actually is a great question. That's a great question. Um, it, it's just amazing because there were anglers that were fishing the Toyota series that were like catching like redfish. I mean, they caught like four or five redfish in practice. Wow. Um, I mean, I'm out there in Quantico looking at like some of the biggest freaking Jared Decatur crabs from Fishburg. I mean, wow. Like eight inch long crabs, you know what I mean? I'm like, good gracious, man. Um, uh, one of my good friends is a guy as well, uh, Thomas Harden, and he posts on his Instagram like all the time. Like he's catching, he's, I mean, he's going out there with one of his guys, man, and and coming home and having dinner like four or five blue crabs. But I, I, how it affects the bass, I, I think um, these tidal large mouth are used to certain levels of salt water. They just, I think they've really come accustomed to it. Um, and they, I think they have the ability to move around. What I think, this is just my opinion, and my opinion could be wrong. Um, that's a good question for somebody like a Marty Gary, um, you know, which I know he's gone now, but great guy. Um, but nonetheless, I think what happens is a lot of these fish go toward like the headwaters where yeah. there's some type of inflow. Um can, do they go from Potomac Creek and run all the way up to Aquaquan? I doubt it. 
Um, but I think they'll just try to find some type of fresh water, or they just they they've made the adaptation that they can stand that that salt water. I mean, you know, let's let's look at uh, the chicken hominy for a prime example. You further down in the bay, I'm sure that parts. I I'd actually like to know the parts per million. At Route Five Bridge, compared to let's say Potomac Creek, that that would be really really interesting. Um, but I think a lot of those fish, man, and this this is one thing Thomas have also noticed about these fish that seem to like more salt water, or there's a change in their diet. I don't know. Maybe somebody in the comment can leave their opinion. Um, when I go down to the Chickahominy River, and you lip a bass in the Chickahominy, man, those things have teeth on. And mm -hmm. I don't know if it's because the salt water. I don't know if it's because the calcium from the diet they eat them. Because there's a, a crap load of uh, fiddler crabs you see on the shorelines down there, and that in turn will give an overload of calcium. Th that's just my my hindsight on it. But um, but yeah, that was a great great question, man. Because I'm sure there's a lot of pros that didn't go down south probably because they felt that the water was too salty. But um, I think you hit the nail on the head. Thing. I think you hit the nail on the head, though. I think the biggest adjustment will be in their forage. Where yeah, if you have more yeah. fiddler crabs, crabs or or, or uh, manhaden coming in, that completely switches it. Because I went, I remember, uh, I think it was last year's All American. It was one by Jared Martin, and uh, he said like he was on a crayfish thing. The, the crayfish were black, and he was catching those. Man, mm -hmm. if, if you didn't know that those were a specific saltwater bait fish, like that's something you could really key in on if you paid attention. Yeah, I mean that. Oh my gosh! I mean, how I say twenty twenty? I wish I, I wish I had my my swim jig box on me, but I don't know. I think I may have put it up on Facebook, like maybe like last year, probably. Probably around June, July, I might have put it up. But I made this blue crab swim jig. I think I made it into a charity bait, too. But, um, man, it was like it had some orange in it, like this uh, uh, like this Okeechobee color. It's like that green pumpkin with the blue in it. Man, I mean, it was just, man, it was nasty. But, um, I mean, I caught fish on it, too. But, you know, one of the things is, is man, the, these tidal river bass, I'm talking about, the chicken hominy, the James, um, even the Rappahannock, um, you know, uh, those rivers, man, they get that influx of, of saltwater species, man, and they just gobble them up. And you figure, I mean, honestly, you know, you get a, a six inch salt shell crab, you know, that's molting in a, in a bed in, in Quantico, man, that six inch, that six inch crab, man, is a whole lot more protein than one little crawfish. So you know, is is there a crab pattern? I'm sure there there is. I mean, I'm definitely sure there is. Um, I can't remember. There was somebody back in the day. Maybe you've seen it. Maybe you can recall. Scott there Martin. was somebody that made that dang on. It was I think it was a CW crab or something like that. It was like crank bait, and it looked just like a crab. And um, man, I had that thing forever, man, and I never ended up throwing it because. By that time, man, there was just grass everywhere, and it was going to run into the grass. But it's like, man, if you find those little areas that, like, you got grass and there's no grass, yeah, that's money, dude. That's money. And that's one of the things that we've seen. Yeah, because, like, I remember Scott Martin's first tournament he ever won as a professional. Uh, I think it was his first year that he turned pro. It was in, I think it was New Orleans, Chad. You can correct me if I'm wrong there. But he said it was a blue crab bite, and he painted mm -hmm. his rattle traps, like, a certain color, and he was yo-yoing it off the bottom, catching the crab. And so it, it will work. And, again, it's just being that, being observant of those little details that is so freaking important. Uh, and then, chat, you know, what we're going to do again, Jake's Bing Tackle gave me permission. Uh, best questions tonight will win a gift card. I'm going to give away three gift cards tonight to the best question asked in chat. Uh, and I'll pick that at the very end. But we got a bunch. I'm going to bang these out before we keep going here. Uh, we, got, we, got Brian, <laughs> we got Brian Henry. Uh, Belmont Bay was a parking lot. I, I, I'm not shocked. It's always a parking lot. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, David Smith saw blue crabs in Powell's Creek two weeks ago. Dude, I had somebody send me a picture of a skate that was caught way up river too. Like the saltwater intrusion is a thing this year. It's insane. Yeah, I think I think Thomas Harden uh, had a picture of like two, three okay. counters raised that he's seen, man. And this is no joke. This is no lie. I was with an angler 
Uh, around July, yeah, around July, and I seen a baby porpoise in Belmont. So I see stuff that I have never seen on that river. So it's yeah, we've reached like all time levels probably of salt that I've never seen, man. It's in, it's insane. And, and but on the flip side of that, even with all the salt water intrusion, and everything, the grass is so freaking thick this year. Uh, it, it's really, really cool to see how, like people, I remember was it like three or four years ago when, when I think it was the old FLW were here and there was no grass and people were bitching. And now we're on the other end of the spectrum where people are like, there's too much grass. We need to get rid of it. <laughs> uh, it it's insane. And what's even crazier is last year's Toyota winner, uh, I, Henry from Florida, a Floridian won it. And then we had another guy from Florida right punching yeah. it. It's just it's insane how those Florida guys in the Potomac, it just fits like a glove. You know, that, and, and, and man, I'm glad you mentioned that, man, because I'm telling you, you, actually, man, you can almost go further than that, man, because then you had Delane, Bobby Lane, another Floridian. I, Florida guys, can, they man, they just, they can pick that grass apart. And then, of course, now I think they're in, uh, I think Bobby's in Gunnersville now. So, yeah. I mean, when it comes to grass, man, these dudes, man, they just know how to fish it and know what to look for, man. And it's just, and I've said it even with, you know, clients of mine have been out with me, you know, there's certain grass you look for certain times of the year. And it was weird. Like I had my best bite on the frog, believe it or not, on like wild celery of all things. And in my opinion, when I'm out there, especially in the spring, man, I don't even, I don't even like fishing wild celery. I mean, I like milfoil. I let milfoil was like the gold, but um, evidently, uh, Friday when I when I was out, man, they were all over that wild salad. So, it's it, there's so many different types of grass out there, man. You almost got to be a, you know, a, a botanist, you know, to mm -hmm. kind of identify this stuff. This some of the grass, to be honest with you, I don't even know what it is. And that's the one thing that these these Florida guys have advantage on is just identifying the different types, and they just they know it like that. But but something else, and 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 Chad, you know, help me out here because again, I am not tapped into like the Potomac teams community because I don't fish it very much, so I wouldn't know anecdotally this. But how many guys around the Potomac would consider themselves hardcore good punchers? I thought that was interesting. That if it's correct that Christian did use that as a key to his thing, is that a technique that a lot of guys up here actually use, or did that give him an edge? I think I think one of the, the, the key things is, you know, we had several years where we didn't have the good grass, so to speak. And I think that whole punching deal when the lane when uh, Bobby Lane was up here and, and he was kicking tail. Um and then remember we had kind of a couple of years too yep, that, that frog bite just went to crap and everybody was like, Okay, what do we do? And you know, I think a lot of guys start, you know, hitting shoreline, start hitting wood, start hitting more hard cover, especially those areas like Piscataway, uh, Little Fountain Creek, you know, Mount Vernon. I remember Mount Vernon had grass all through there for two miles, it looked like. But the river has changed so much. So I think a lot of those guys that no punching and no punching well they can key those areas and have it to themselves. And well, I think us locals, we kind of like pulled away from it and we're doing like all the techniques, mm -hmm. especially, um, I think it was the invitations, correct me if I'm wrong, Tom, but I think the winner of, there wasn't the invitations. I think there was like a Northeast region. Tackle warehouse? Or, yeah, I think it was like a TBF, like right before that. And the oh, guy, the ba Bassmaster. The, uh, yeah. Bassmaster. Yeah, there was like something like right before that, the Northeast Division, and the, and the guy was was cranking him out on on a uh, on on a swim bait, you know, glide bait. And glide bait, yeah. Like, man, dude, I don't even own a glide bait. Be honest with you, I don't even own one. I don't even have a rod to throw it on. When you know, I so, interviewed Brian, that blew my mind when he did that. I got <laughs> I got to interview him, and he and what's funny as hell is he went from Lake Hartwell for the regional. And drove straight to the Potomac, and that's where he he got his ass kicked on that specific thing, and then he just implemented it on the Potomac, and it was just like, I don't think has anyone actually won a glide bait tournament on the Potomac before. That's got to be like a first. That's insane. And it, it's interesting though, man, because I I don't know about anybody else on this podcast, but I tell you what, you go to YouTube and you watch these guys, 
throwing these dang on uh, glide baits, and all of a sudden you see this swirl. I, I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's oh right, and 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 for the average angler, for the average angler, you see this six, eight inch, nine inch bait, man. It's like, oh my god, you know what am I throwing this thing on? You know if. if it's weird. You got the full face of sonar guys are throwing these itty, itty bitty baits, you know, and then you got the other crowd that are throwing like these huge glide baits, you know. And I remember when the single first came out, it's like, man, you had to try to out finesse the finesse guy. Now you got those guys that are still trying to out finesse the finesse guy, but then you got the power guys that are throwing these, you know, huge glide baits, man. They're getting bit on it, you know, especially on the James River. I see guys. All the time, posting on it, so it's it's cool, man. I mean, I like I like to see the diversity in the fishery as far as you know, glide baits and you know, not the same old stuff all the time. It's it's actually interesting, very interesting. You mentioned something when we first began here, with it being September and the grass eventually will start dying off, you know, harder and harder. Um, that we are going to go to hardcover, but I think the interesting thing is it's completely easy to say like there's a ton of grass, fish grass. There's no grass, fish hardcover. When do you like to make the jump to be like, I should probably focus more on hardcover now? I think that 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 transition thing, late October, November, it's easy to make that decision. But yeah. now is the hard time of like, I should focus on blank. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's just my honest opinion. It, you know, when you're pulling up on, on, on an area, let's say it's Quantico or if it's Chickamauxin or, you know, even Occoquan, when I'm looking at that grass and I'm fishing it, and I'm not getting bit. I'm looking at this grass, and you know, I pull a piece up, you know, with a chatterbait or whatever. I'm looking at it. If it looks like it's just no life in it, I mean, it's it's not like dirty because you can mm-hmm. it could still be green, but just be dirty. But when you look at that grass, it's just like it's done. It's you know, I worked actually as as a landscaper for the U.S. Capitol for 17 years, and one thing that people have to realize with plant life is that when plants start dying, it eats up oxygen and it creates carbon dioxide. Well, would you think about it, but think about it. Would you start your car up, close your, close your garage up and breathe that air in? What's it going to do to you? It's going to kill you. Probably not a good idea, yeah. Probably not a good idea either. <laughs> don't do it, y'all. Don't yeah. do it. Yeah, we don't advise that. We don't advise that. But seriously, you know, carbon dioxide kills. I mean, it's it's like poison. So what happens with these grass beds, you get these massive grass beds that are dying from the Potomac. And what happens is it they can tell that, hey, this grass is dying. It feels toxic. They leave. They leave. So once you start seeing a lot of these grass beds really not just dirty, but actually dying, Start looking for hard cover right there. Now. I mean, we are like right there, right now. I believe that the hard cover bite is just going to start getting better by the day, you know. And then we also got the the daylights getting shorter too, so they know just like in the springtime, these fish know, hey, daylight's getting longer. Hey, it's time to hit the banks. It's time to spawn. They can also tell, hey, these days are getting shorter. Hey, we need to start feeding up for winter time because it's going to start getting cold. So, no, that's that's one of the big things, Thomas. I look for man. Look at that grass, and honestly, Tom, some grasses uh, are more vibrant than others according to temperature. You know, uh, I think wild sour is probably one of the last ones that really kind of hold on. Um, but I, you know, everybody, you know, they have a personal opinion. I think most guys like to fish the mill for because it's it's just easier to fish, it's easier to run a chatter bait in compared to mats of high driller that you know give you four inches of water, you know. So it's you know definitely want to look for the greenest grass. If you don't have it, run through the wood, run through the rock. How did the tropical storm affect things going into the, the, the next round of BFL and, and tournaments that we have coming up in October? Man, I'm going to tell you, you the, the tropical, the tropical storms, I, BFL guys, you check your weather. Check your weather. Check your tides. 
because you might practice. And, oh, yeah, you know, they're eating on the low water as soon as the tide, so, you know. What well, folks got to realize, you got a low tide, let's say nine o'clock. That's important, but was very important. Look at the top of that chart, what you got. And what does it say? It says tired prediction. Tired prediction. So, yeah, lunar wise and gravity wise, yeah, nine o'clock. A lot of times we start getting these storms, it's going to happen. It happens every year, these fall tournaments. We start getting a, a coastal low or, or a tropical storm or even a hurricane right before then. We get two to three foot storm surges, puts us that tide. And honestly, the tide may never even go out. You know, mm. so that is a key thing. I mean, there's, you know, if I, I mean, I'm going to break this down to any angler that's fishing a BFL or any Potomac tournament, you know, and I'm not perfect, but this is what I look for. Number one, definitely check your tides. Yeah. Number two, you always want to check your weather. I mean, you can't change the weather. I get it. If it's going to rain, if it's going to blow 10 miles an hour, you can't change it. You got to fish what's in front of you. What is very, very important, I can't stress it enough, look at your wind direction too. If you get an east wind, it's going to hold that tide. Or a south wind, it's going to hold that tide in. So if you want that low tide bite or you want that tide to start going out, you get one of those storms, it's definitely, definitely going to affect your bite because you can't sit there and say, oh, man, they should be biting at 930. Now the tide is going to start going out. Well, man, it could be delayed a whole hour, and it might be a certain water level that you may not even see because the term is going to be over. So, uh, And that's what I experienced even on day two, man. I mean, that tide... It was supposed to be coming in, Thomas, but man, I mean, she rocked in. I mean, she really? rolled in, man. I mean, way quicker, way quicker. I, if I had to time it, I would say it was almost an hour and a half early. And, and as far as water levels, where I wanted to be, it really advanced it. Really advanced it. This gets into a great argument about styles on fishing tides you always hear from the bass masters the iconellis which he does it extremely well i'm not saying you can't win is is the milk runs and running the tides mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but more often than not i just get my ass kicked and i know i'm gonna suck if i start moving because i it might i might i might not be in the best spot but i know i will be at the spot when it's at its best if i sit mm -hmm. there but if i run and i'm off or the tide does something freaky you're, you're screwed yeah you're screwed you're screwed I mean, I you know, I mean, me, yeah, me being a river rat, but you know, one thing, I, 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 you can definitely do these milk runs, but as far as like, man, I'm gonna start in a choir, I'm gonna run all the way up to, you know, three creeks. I mean, I've never like kind of done that. I know guys that have a will. Um, typically, you know, I'll I'll look at two to three creeks and and try to work that because. Yeah, I think one of the biggest thing is you can do well within. I'm going to say, a, a five to eight, you know, as the crow flies radius on the on the Potomac. Yeah. I think the biggest thing is you got to have a low tide spot. You got to have a high tide spot, and not just a low tide or high tide spot, but some spots are better on an incoming tide. Some spots are better on an outgoing tide. Or outgoing as far as the bottom of the tide, you know what I mean? Because a lot of guys say, oh, man, you got to have a good low tide spot. Well, low tide, what do you mean low tide? I mean, is the first two hours of incoming or is the last two hours of, of outgoing? So, and, and uh, I mean, man, Did I you mean. these comments it, by Richard? Uh -huh. <laughs> Richard Harding. So where do you start on a flood tide? <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're just flood tide. up the creek on the flat, shallow water. What do you do, man? But look, Thomas, that's a great question. It is a good it, question. It really is, man. That's a man. That's an awesome question because you get those flood tides when, when that storm surges up two feet. You know what I really believe? Hit the bank. Hit the mm -hmm. bank. I mean, if you got a grass flat, let's 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 look at Belmont, okay? Let's let's get an example. Let's look at Belmont Bay. Everybody knows, you know, you come offshore, there's a lot of grass right there in Belmont. 
I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't care how green that grass is. If I'm not getting bit in that middle, I'm hitting the bank. I'm hitting the bank. I want to look for wood or grass near wood or any type of hard cover that you can find. The other thing is pull up on some hard cover, man. To go up in the Occoquan, sit some of that hard cover stuff on that high tide, man, because they'll get up on these in these trees or on the boat docks good. Because I mean, it's a whole new world for them. You, I mean, you're giving them more acreage. Why make it harder yourself? Go to shallow cover and start beating the bank. You know, look at that hard cover. You may even have a mix of hard cover with grass. Man, that is like that's an awesome question. That's a great question. Great, great question. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, message me and uh, I'll get you. Uh, I'll get you your gift card to, to Jake Spate and Tackle. Uh, another thing that always comes up, at, at least I've seen in my comment section, is is the whole DC thing. Do these big tournaments? Do people not go to DC because of the whole like fishing license issue and you have to idle? Like, is that get overlooked? Because I, personally, I have not heard of DC playing since. Oh God! Like what? Well, since the Bass Masters, like a long time ago, when Justin Lucas won. Yeah, I, I, I that man, that I, I. This is just what I believe. I believe, yes, it is a factor. You know, I think not as much as factor as back in the day. Reason being is back in the day, you had to go to a tackle store, you had to find somebody that was selling DC license. Nowadays. I mean, you can pick up your phone, boom, 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 five minutes, you got a DC license. Oh. So it's a lot easier now to, to, to get that DC license. And because one of my co was, you know, I said, yeah, I might end up running up north. And he said, how far do I got to get a DC license? <laughs> So a lot of coaches, man, they're not they're not prepared, man, to run yeah. up north of, of 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 Fox Ferry Point, man, and go up in the National Harbor and Fort McNair Wall and stuff like that. I mean, truth be told, I mean, I, me, I'm a I'm a southern guy. I mean, I fished up north some, but I mean, I'm gonna be honest with you, man. I I haven't fished like I can curve for two ninety five in like probably twenty years. You know, not saying they ain't fished there. You know, now what I will say is this. What I will say is this. I think there's a difference now how guys run because of fuel. Because back in the day, you know, yeah, fill up the tank, man, dollar and three cents, you know, mm-hmm. dollar five cents. You know, everybody running two strokes, you know what I mean? Now with the economy and gas and everything else, I think a lot of locals, man, they're not running that up there, you know, 22 miles going past the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, you know. So, I mean, guys would do it back then, no problem at all. But I think now it's put the squeeze in, and now guys are trying to squeeze every fish out of local areas. And, they don't, I mean, who wants to run 20-something miles when I can run, you know, five miles and possibly get the same quality of fish. I think what happens is those fish get left alone. And you start getting up north now, those fish, quote, unquote, should be easier to catch because they're not pressured. They're not pressured. I mean, there's only a small handful of guys that even go up there now. You know, I mean, I have not had one trip near D.C. unless someone actually requests, hey, I want to fish near the tidal basin. I want to have some pictures with my husband and, and we're fishing, you know, and seeing the cherry blossoms. And I mean, that's great. That's one of the beautiful things that we have about the Potomac River, man. I mean, it's a it's a beautiful national body of water. I mean, you got the tidal basin. We got Thomas Jefferson Memorial. You know, we have all these b- beautiful things in our river system. Um, but the average guy, hey, I just want to go out and catch a largemouth. I mean, we ain't running 20 miles in D.C., but there's great fishing up there. Great fishing. So some kid called SB Fishing has a question. He says, hey, Chris, can you legally run on the right side of the river past the Wilson Bridge? Um, I think there is a six-knot zone around it. Don't quote me. I Don't quote me because I have not seen the – local toss as of lately um i'm gonna say this much there's those pilots that i will always remember <laughs> that are on that fox ferry side and if you don't know where they are trust me there's probably a couple of lower units sitting down there right now um definitely want to be careful run through I, this is just me and what i advise on that right side take your time take your time and take your time again um 
you know, of course you got National Harbor sitting right there. So I'm sure uh, I'm sure there's some police boats sitting there waiting for somebody to blow through a six knot or whatever through there. So but what I do know is on that left side, going close to the Amazon Alexandria side, I believe you can run, you know, on plane through there. But um I just don't fish that section a whole lot. Um honestly, that's a great question for uh Captain Steve Chicotas because he's been fishing that area of the river or uh uh, Captain John Sisson, they're uh, great, great guys that fish that uh, area of the river all the time. But that's a great question, too, man, because a lot of people don't know. And this is a danger thing. I remember I fished a college tournament. Um, this was a long time ago. And some friends of mine from Adrian College, they didn't know the river. And so they tried to go into the Marine Creek. And they got rude awakening when they tried to go into there. And you don't realize there's so many places on this river that, like, you might get shot if you actually try to go. To, to go in there uh, it's different yeah i mean what, one of the things man i mean I, these old i'm gonna call them these old bodies of water the potomac i mean you gotta remember i mean you know one of the old guys have been around for a long time kim penrod of course he wrote the potomac river uh fishing bible for the potomac river and i read it i mean it was a great old book um it's out of production now but i mean there was a lot of good history in that book that talked about um you know, some of the colonial uh, times, I mean, like like Bitter's Rock, there's a there's a lot of rock piles, a lot of ballast rock piles, even uh, close to the thrill of, excuse me, uh, nice bridge, the 95 bridge up there. There's a lot of like ballast rock and things that were left in the water. And some are marked, some are not marked, some are on the water, some you may not see on a high tide. Um, you know, but I would highly advise, you know, for... You guys that have never been on the river or it's your first time owning a boat or want to run the river, take your time. I mean, take your time. I mean, that, that, I cannot stress that enough. If you don't know, go slow. I mean, that's that's my main, main thing. Um, there, I mean, believe it or not, man, there, there's stuff in Belmont Bay. If you don't know what you're doing or where mm -hmm. these piles are, I mean, you can hit some stuff in, in, in Belmont Bay as well. Um and don't even try to go on the James River. You want to I meet <laughs> James River is a whole other animal by itself, you know. So, yeah, like if you don't know, take it slow. Trust me. All righty, folks. The rest of this show is going to continue on Patreon. Chris, thank you so much for coming on tonight. I really appreciate it. Could you please just let everyone know where they can follow you and what you have going on? No problem at all. Um, before I go to, man, I really wanted to uh, give a shout out, man, to like Chris Donovan with uh, DNS Fabrication and uh, Weldon. Man, I, I couldn't fish that tournament, man, without you. I really appreciate you, man. Kimmy Ann, Bait and Tackle, and the 540 Fishing Community, man. Hey, 540 Fishing, man, y'all continue, please, man, to, to support Thomas, man, with Fishing DMV, man. Thomas, I really appreciate you tonight, brother. Really oh. do. Always look forward to speaking with you, man. No, oh, thank you so much. And then you also have a speaking engagement, right? Coming up too. Yeah, thank you for reminding me. So everybody, y'all know that uh, Academy uh, Sporting Goods is coming to Fredericksburg. You know, thank God we got another uh, a venue for outdoors. And, you know, the other thing is to y'all is it's not just, you know, fishing or hunting, you know, I mean, it's, you know, if you're in the golf, if you're in the track, if you're lifting, whatever aerobics, whatever you want to do, it's just going to be another store, um, that we're going to have in the Fetchersburg area, man. And I appreciate y'all, man. Y'all come on through. So I'm going to be speaking three different times um, at Academy. It's going to be October 7th is when the grand opening is. I think there's a soft opening on October to October the second. So y'all stop by. Y'all ask me plenty of questions, man. I'll try to have a few things maybe I can give away to y'all guys. Again, you know, Thomas, man, I appreciate y'all for everything I'm y'all have done man y'all fans out there y'all keep supporting the channel man because this is honestly one of the best channels out here man that's going to give you true information man i mean you've you've had so many champions and so many great guys on here man and you always man thomas you always bring good points to the show man as always, guys, link in the episode description, everything we talked about. If you'd like to join us on Patreon, the link is down below. And again, the rest of the show is going to be continuing on Patreon. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle. 
located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.